in 2007, financial services earned 40% of all profits in America. And I thought, well, you know, come on, there's, there's a giant pie. Somebody's going to innovate and do it. So I started uh, Betterment in 2007, wanting to make people, help people make the most of their money, uh, help them live, live better lives. Hi, all. I'm Rex, the founder of Cambria, a community for founders and builders in fintech. Incredibly excited for today's episode, as our guest is none other than John Stein, the founder and CEO of Betterment. So John started his company in 2007 during the Great Recession, and he helped birth the creation of a new category of wealth managers, robo-advisors. Today, Betterment has 750,000 happy customers, representing $35 billion in assets. And on this episode, we're going to cover a whole bunch of great material, everything from why he started Betterment, how he met his founding team, then also the darkest moment in the company's history when he had to separate from a co-founder. And then fast forward, what it was like for him to step down 13 years after founding the company as CEO and hire in a replacement. And then finally, we're going to cover what's next for Betterment and the robo-advisory category. So stay with us. We've got a great program for you. Should be a lot of fun. John, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for having me, Rex. It's great to be here with you. Awesome. Uh, And so I think A great place to start would be back at the very beginning, 2007. Uh, Why exactly you decided to start Betterment? I had been thinking about this space for a long time. As an undergrad, I studied economics and a little bit of psychology. And I was really interested in the intersection of those two fields. Why people make the decisions that we do how we can help people make better decisions. When I graduated, no one was hiring for, you know, people to help make, help, help people make better decisions. That's not a, that's not a common career path. Um, They were Mm -hmm. recruiting, however, to say, help big financial institutions make more money. And so I went to do that for a little while. I joined First Manhattan Consulting Group. And with them, I helped many of the the largest banks in the U.S. and around the world. Uh, And through working with those banks and brokers, I got a better understanding of how these institutions work, what, how they acquire customers, how they think about those customers and what they do. There's a lot of well-intentioned people at all these institutions trying to do the right thing, but with maybe not the best incentives. And often they're working at odds you know, against their customers' best interests. And I thought it would be fun, easy, um, uh, interesting to build a company that was really aligned with customers' best interests in financial services, that always did the right thing for the customer. Yeah, you said fun, easy, interesting. I feel like one of those things profitable. might be true. <laughs> yeah, profitable. Is, 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 is the challenge. Because you got to, you got to, you know, you got to make your money somewhere. How do you do it in the most customer aligned way? And, uh, and I iterated on the idea a bunch. I, I hit upon the idea of uh, an advisor will be an investment advisor. When our customers make more money, we'll make more money. We'll be aligned with them in that sense. Uh, and we'll provide a, a bunch of services that uh, that people ought to have. Simple things like portfolio diversification, tax loss harvesting, asset location across different account types, uh, advice about how much to save and uh, and how to do it in which accounts, all of that kind of stuff you can do as an advisor. So I started uh, Betterment in 2000, uh, in 2007, wanting to make people help people make the most of their money, uh, help them li- live better lives. Um, it took a lot to, to grow. We can talk all about the things, um, but today, better manages about thirty-five billion uh, for seven hundred fifty thousand Americans. So it's it's grown into quite a, a real business. Yeah, it's been yeah pretty impressive to to follow the growth, not just of Betterment, but the whole category that you know Betterment and other robo advisors have helped to to pioneer. Um, so maybe a good place to start about you know getting started two thousand seven there. There aren't 250 other fintech companies. There isn't a whole bunch of talent you can draw on in the ecosystem to go out and um, bring together a founding team. So talk to me about the initial team you recruited, which I think involves someone you met playing poker uh, and and a New York City roommate. Well, you mentioned that that there's not maybe a lot of, uh, of, of tech talent out there. Let me also set the stage and say there's no fintech. That's not a word that exists yet. Um, there's there's no New York tech scene, right? There's 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 just almost no startups in New York. And at that time, there was there were questions preceding like, the 
Great Recession, everything in banking is booming. So why why <laughs> do anything else? <laughs> practically, yeah. that's right. I, I mean, but, but that's exactly right. And and that's when I was consulting to these banks. They, they were heady days. I mean, we were making so much money um, in in financial services. I saw at that time that I thought there had to be sort of an end to that to that party. Um, and, and in two thousand seven. Financial services earned forty percent of all profits in America, um, and and that just seemed like a crazy share of of the wealth that's that's being created was going to financial services companies. And I thought, well, you know, come on, there's, there's a giant pie. Somebody's going to innovate and do it. But recruiting people to that was hard because uh, there were almost no investors who would look at the space because everything that was successful in tech up until that time was a marketplace or an ad tech platform or something like that. Uh, so there was lots of attention on those, but very, almost none on fintech. And uh, and recruiting hires was was challenging because, you know, you know they, they saw the same things that the investors saw. Like, and so necessarily early on, I hired whoever I could. <laughs> I talked to everybody um, I, uh, and, and anyone who would listen to me and, and my, all my poor business school classmates and friends uh, you know, from, from, from college or whatever heard me talk a lot about this idea to reinvent financial services in a customer-friendly way. Uh, and one person who, who finally, you know, started working with me to shut me up was my roommate, Sean, who was an engineer at, at Google. You know, he, he, I, w- without Sean, uh, who I just saw this last weekend at, at a wedding, um, you know, not, not a betterment would have happened. He said, yeah, like, I'll work on this with you. And like, here's some books to read. Um, here's, here's some things to, to, to help you get started. And he taught me how to code so I could build the front end of the, the website while he stood up the back end and the Apache server and Tomcat and whatever else we had back and then, uh, and, uh, and then Eli, um, also without whom, you know, we wouldn't, wouldn't have gotten started because, um, at that time I was doing all the legal stuff too, and figuring out how to register us as an investment advisor or a fund. And I, you know, I, my mind just isn't, isn't all that good at that stuff. I bought all the books, I read it, but I was just spinning and I handed this, all my books to Eli. And I said, just get us a license, just get us up and running. <laughs> and that was his project for a couple of years. He owned that uh, and deserves credit for for getting us registered with the SEC, registered as a uh, as a broker dealer as well with Finra, registered in all fifty states. We said back at that time we had a map on the wall of all the states, and you know one by one we were checking off you know when we had five customers in that state and we were registered. I think talking about like the darkest day for you in Betterman's history and what it looked like to actually part ways with a co-founder is a pretty interesting story that doesn't always get told. Um, because there's a lot going on there and it can be a hard story to tell. There's always a lot going on, that's right. So one of the most challenging days at Betterment was uh, in those early days when Sean and Eli and our product manager, Anthony, uh, were all working together. We were working in Union Square, um, it was the, the year after I graduated business school, so 2009, Sean was in London. The other three of us were in yeah. New York. Sean had started business school over there. And as I said before, without Sean, we would have had no betterment. And, uh, and, and the more we got from Sean, the better things were. He's, he's just a, he's a brilliant engineer. The hard thing was that, that he was in London, so we were making decisions in New York. And then, you know, um, he was clocking in and, and disagreeing with those or we were disagreeing with something that he'd done. And just communication was, was challenging across, across many time zones and not being physically together uh, early on was, was tough. The, the video chats and everything weren't as good then as they are, as they are today either. So it was even harder to, to work remotely. And eventually we just broke up and, you know, I tried to, to save the relationship. You know, we, we remain friends, uh, at, you know, we're, we're very close, um, but, uh, but working together wasn't, wasn't going to happen. And I remember walking with Eli around Union Square, taking several laps as we discussed whether we could go on and, you know, was there a future when you lose a co-founder, it's, uh, it's, it's really tough. Losing a co-founder is very hard. Losing a technical co-founder in New York and then having to recruit in someone else in those times, also very hard. Talk through what it was like to hire the first stranger to the company, because this would have been the first real um, other person you brought in besides the, the three of you. At this time, I didn't have another friend 
that I could just pull in to take over engineering. Remember, there were there weren't that many engineers in New York in general. You, there weren't you talked that to many. all your business school classmates, not not many yeah. of whom, you know, were engineers. I mean, no, none no, of them. And then, yeah, yeah, exactly. But I did. But what I too. did, I, I went to the Columbia Network uh, because I'd gone to business school at Columbia, and so I. Uh, I tapped, there's a, there was like a blue tech mailing list and I got into that and I yeah. posted this job and someone who was working in, uh, in one of the, the biotech labs at Columbia saw it, was interested in trying something different. And Kieran Keshev interviewed with us, uh, thank, thank goodness. But, you know, he was the first kind of stranger hire to, to come into Betterment, somebody who, who I didn't, who I hadn't known uh, as a friend before. First of all, I advise a bunch of early stage fa- founders now. And one of the things that I, I like to say is like in, in the beginning, you almost have to hire crazy people, right? Like a- anybody <laughs> who's leaving a big established job to join your idea that has you know no traction, no obvious product market fit. That doesn't mean they're not smart and competent and capable, you know, and all, all those great things too. But but um, finding that that person is can be tough. When Kieran was first interested, he we got him to yes fairly quickly, and then we gave him an offer, and and you know we weren't able to pay. But this was before funding, right? So this was this was a lot of equity and a lot of hope, <laughs> <laughs> and um, and he didn't know us, right? So he said he said sorry, I've got to pass. And I got the sense, or he you know maybe he t- I think he told me um, that uh, that his his wife. Had, had kind of talked him out of it, and I said, "Let's all go get dinner." We we all we all got together. I I knew that the future of of this company, of this industry, of this idea, you know, depended on getting Kieran to to say yes, and uh, and we did. We 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 pulled out all the stops, and eventually got him to come back and and come around and and give us a go. That was tough. And then for a long time, we still we couldn't pay him and Anthony, you know, anything, you know, like a modern, you know, salary for somebody working at a tech company. Uh, we at one point we even had to ask them to buy more equity from the company so that we could continue to pay them. <laughs> um, so they, they paid their own salaries for for a little while. Yeah, uh, it was uh, it was it was thin thin times. Yeah, and yeah, so. You didn't raise your first real institutional round of funding until I think 2010 with the Series A from Bessemer. Uh, so maybe talk about that milestone a little bit. Well, we got some initial momentum from winning TechCrunch Disrupts Best Startup in New York and just getting a lot of airtime on stage with Michael Arrington and Chris Saka and other notable folks talking about our business and the pluses and minuses, but you know, in front of an audience of 20,000 you know, a few of those crazy folks signed up uh, and started giving us some money. And I remember thinking, oh, gosh, I can't believe we have a million dollars of customer funds. Like, who are these crazy people who've trusted us with a million bucks on the internet? Because remember, at that time, <laughs> there, was no, there was no Venmo, there was very, there was no online, you know, no checking, you know, like, there just wasn't anything, uh, yeah. like no sort of financial online services. Everyone had a branch and you'd go to it. So they gave us that early traction. And we took shopped that around to some investors. And we met with Bessemer. Uh, and uh, and Rob Stavis from Bessemer told us in the first meeting, he said, you know, we've been looking for two years for a company that's going to answer the question, what should I do with my money? And you guys seem to have the best answer to that question that I've seen. Uh, and we were looking for a million bucks. And he said, how about three million bucks, which was a, a tiny, uh, a tiny round today, but was like a a lot more money than I was looking for back then, and I thought it would last us forever. And so we um, <laughs> we we started building with that that initial three million bucks, and just had a ton of early early momentum. Yeah, you kind of had this high. You, you won TechCrunch Disrupt. You raised a bigger round almost than you had expected to from a, a great firm with a great history. And then after building and getting some initial traction, things start to slow down a little bit. Exactly. Yeah, I. I you, you said it well. It was um, that was a tough time, and between 2010 and, and 2012, um, you know, we, it took us a year to get to 10 million dollars under management. So it was 2011, a year after we launched, we hit we hit 10 million, and our uh, investors at Bessemer took us out to dinner. We celebrated. We said this is a big a big deal, um, but. Uh, 
slowly, very slowly, things started to accelerate too slowly at first. In fact, we had to get a bridge uh, financing to keep the keep the company going. And that took a lot of effort, as you can imagine, to, to put together when you're not seeing the kind of, uh, of exponential growth you want yep. to see. We did it. And, uh, and then a competitor entered the space. We saw uh, Wealthfront in, um, uh, in, in SF kind of pivot from a different model. They changed their name. They, they, they were like, you know, comparing trading. Formerly known as Kaching, which is yeah, most on top exactly, of exactly. Facebook. And yeah. And, you know, to us, it felt like they were like ripping off our model a little bit. But all of a sudden we had a, we had a competitor. And I remember at that time thinking we just have to beat them on every count, right? When, the, when you write the comparison, I want to win on every point. And we had our pricing was 90 basis points at the most expensive down to like 30 basis points for the, the you know, the cheapest at that time. And we cut all of it to match or beat Wealthfront's pricing. You know, we said 25 will be like this, the standard rack rate pricing, but we're going to be 15 basis points cheaper than them if you have a lot of money with us. Um, and I just... I just wanted to win on everything, right? Anything they would do, yep. we would do better. And so, yep. you know, in a lot of ways, that um, that competition was really good for us as a company. I think it was good for both of us. I think without them, I don't Th think- That's what I wanted to say too. Yeah, like you think you have a competitor under the space. You've got 10 million in assets. They have however many million in assets. But there are tens of trillions of assets that have not moved over to any sort of like automated investing service. And all of a sudden, you're a category. And yeah. that's pretty powerful. Yeah, what launched us initially, remember, was that coverage at TechCrunch. But after that, getting coverage was hard because we're, we're, we said, we're better men, we're different, we're doing this thing that's better than anything. And, you know, once there's been a piece about it, no, no second journalist wants to go write that piece because they've already got it. But when you have a competition between a couple of folks or a rivalry, um, and there's a category to talk about and you can rate the two and say what's changed about that rivalry and how they rank today. Suddenly there's a lot of press and a lot of people reading about what's going on in our space and a lot of attention. And that kind of rising tide lifts all boats. And uh, and we certainly benefited from from that uh, that that rivalry and attention. Yeah. And then you're you're able to turn some of that into like better growth, increasing the average account balance, increasing balances generally. Oh, absolutely. In 2010, the year we launched, our average balance was $1,500. Then we cut our pricing and our average balance went up. We added IRAs and our average balance went up. All that attention that, that we were talking about and our average balance goes up. So it climbed to 3,000 the next year and then 8,000 and then 15,000 and then 25,000, up, up, up. Uh, and in 2000, you got to the point where you're able to raise a series B off of the momentum you'd made in terms of growth. Um, I think sometime around mid 2012. That's right. That's right. And then a series C and, and D and, and we just, and, and it, and it, and everything was working in the business at that time. Every year we were acquiring more customers more cheaply and they were bringing us more money each. And so, the you know we had those projections and we just kind of kept beating the projection on on every on every on every metric and that that felt really really great and at that time I I, I projected that our average balance would pretty steadily over a period of of uh, a few years but steadily approach that of say E Trade at ninety thousand or Schwab at one hundred twenty thousand. Um, uh, but what surprised me was that in about 2016, that average balance just leveled off at uh, at at 50,000 or so, uh, and has remained there to this day. Now, for the earliest cohorts of Betterment customers, like 2010s and 11s, you know, it's still going up, and it's actually it's it's significantly above that level now. But because we're constantly bringing new customers in. And their balances are lower and they're a significant share of our customers. And they're also millennials, like they're tech savvy. They, you know, they're, they're, they're younger than the Schwab customer base. They're younger than the um, E-Trade customer base significantly. The average age yep. at Schwab is 62. The average age at E-Trade when, when they were independent was, you know, 58. And our average age was 38, you know, so 
people just have less less money when when they're younger on average and in general and so that average balance kind of leveled off and that made everything challenging you know <laughs> like that was uh, that was a, a, a significant, you know, assumption in our, in our model and sort of seeing that top out meant, well, we can't keep accelerating, you know, the amount that we're spending on customer acquisition each year. We can spend this much and like this is, you know, and because we don't want to, you know, increase our burn dramatically. Um, and so uh, we had to we had to retool and, and rethink. And we tried a bunch of different things to move that number. We We tried you know, punching. Yeah, as you put it to me earlier, you try going yeah up, you try going down, you try going sideways, all with the hope of expanding that. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Kind of we, average assets. We did tax coordinated portfolios, which is a complicated, you know, like a complicated thing that basically helps you make more money off of your money without you doing anything, right? It saves you on mm-hmm. taxes and, and lots of interesting, interesting and clever, you know, costless ways. And we made that freely available to all of our customers. That's a great thing for higher net worth customers, but you know, it didn't really like move the move the needle too much. We we went down. We we added checking accounts, you know, with the thought of like, well, let's just like bring in, you know, this sort of like mass funnel of folks. But like, people were coming and still are coming to Betterment for our investment management, not for our you know great checking account. It's like a nice add on product. It makes people stickier and uh, more loyal, and maybe increases their balances a little bit, but you know, it doesn't, you know, it didn't really move, move the needle. And we tried things like HSAs and different distribution channels. And, uh, you know, um, that has has also been successful. But, you know, none of these things change that sort of like core, here's here's what our average balance is. And um, that that proved tricky with pricing at, at 25 basis points and, uh, and, a, and a balance at, at 50, you can kind of do the math of, uh, you know, we've, we've got, 120, 100, you know, 125 ish bucks um, to work with, you know, of, of, of revenue per year. Of, yeah, annualized revenue per user. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And the, the costs of, of running the business, the COGS are, are not great, right? Like we're, we're very efficient. Um, but you want to try to get payback as quickly as possible on, on your marketing dollars. Most, most investors want to see, you know, they love to see less than a year, right? Um, and in, in this industry and in investment management, the incumbents are comfortable running a four year payback, right? Yep. And so for like for VC investors, that's a tricky thing to kind of get around. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things you wanted to try expanding into was you were started as a B2C company and you wanted to move to a, a B2B to C company. And that wasn't always very popular. And it took a while to get started, but maybe talk through the journey of moving from direct consumer to more channel partnership driven yeah it's it, and it's really it's a great question it's related to this idea of the average balance topping out and what do you do about about unit economics um but before i get there i'll i'll, I'll take a step back and say that when we were on stage at TechCrunch, somebody asked me hey what are you guys going to do 401ks like is that a thing i said well yeah i mean Definitely someday that that's going to be a, an important part of this business, but we need to start in retail because it's, it's proof of concept. It's kind of getting that that early traction and then we'll we'll build into these other other channels over time. Fidelity, the way they get most of their accounts is through retirement. They, they sell they sell B2B, they get customers through 401ks and then they cross sell those customers into retail products or Schwab gets most of their customers through investment advisors. Um, Two thirds yep. of Schwab's assets is on the investment advisor side. People think of them as a retail brand or like consumers think of them as a retail brand, but that's a tiny portion of their business. Yeah, and FinTech, we often think about product innovation, product innovation, product innovation. And then you look at a lot of financial services and it's distribution, distribution, distribution. Totally. And then that explains why the, the products don't have the most innovative experiences in the world. That's totally right. And so I thought at that time, we'll have to, back, back when I was starting out, eventually we're going to have to get into this B2B distribution um, once we have some product market fit with, with our retail customer base. Uh, and, uh, and in 2014, we launched the Betterment for Advisors platform. And in 2016, around the time this balance was topping out, we launched the Betterment for Business platform. And those were things that they were projects I was really excited about. I was just looking back at some emails, um, uh, uh, la- last week about the first hire for Betterment for Business and one in my 
uh, my head of people asked me uh, in an email exchange from 2016, are you sure this is going to be a separate line of business? Is this 401k thing really, really, do we really need to set this up? As a and I said, yes. And I get a lot of pushback from, uh, from my board, from my team, from, you know, from a lot of folks about why are we, we have this thing that's working, this retail thing. Why are we building new lines of business? What, like, this is a huge tax, a huge distraction. Um, and they, they're right. Like it is those things too. Right. So, so it's, um, you know, it, it took a lot of conviction to, to kind of soldier through those criticisms. Um, I took a lot, of, a lot of flack for it <laughs> over the years, but I'll say that, um, whether that was the right decision or wrong decision, you know, coming into 2023, uh, we're, we'll see, I think more than 50% of our new assets, new customers are coming through those B2B channels. Uh, and, yeah. uh, and they are growing much fat, even though the retail business is growing nicely, um, the mm -hmm. B2B businesses are growing faster, but it took six years. It took a long yeah. time to make that shift from a retail marketing, um, CPA focused organization brand and da, da, da. And now we have a whole sales team and we have customer and we have, you know, the onboarding and the. SDRs and the relationship managers and uh, this whole different infrastructure that I didn't know anything about. None of my team knew anything about. Uh, and so that's um, that's a challenging transition to make to go B to B to B to C or vice versa. Uh, and uh, yeah. and we're doing we're doing both. <laughs> so. Well, it's it's also interesting how startups can both be built very quickly and grow very quickly. But then if you look at some of them, you realize that the core things that make them work can actually take a really long time. So you started with the direct consumer and you had a few laws and growth and things you had unlocked there. But then, you know, 2009 or whenever it was, tech countries disrupt, you said, I'm going to do B2B, but you didn't launch your betterment for business until like eight years later. Yeah. And then it took another six years for it to drive, you know, five years to start driving meaningful growth. And then six, seven years, it's actually driving the majority of growth. Yeah. And so I think it's an interesting lesson for entrepreneurs to say, you know, not only can I like build quickly and see quick results, but sometimes you have to move with conviction and take a long time to get to the place where you're an overnight success. You know, some of the the, the best management, you know, uh, and and business school frameworks are about how do you make decisions when you don't have a lot of information and you know you have to work on something for a long time before you see see it come to to fruition. Yeah, and another thing I wanted to ask you about. Um, it's to draw on a quote you had, which was startups are like a roller coaster. Yes, because as we've talked about, there are a lot of ups and downs in building the business, but also you're strapped in and can't get off. And usually getting off looks like something like an exit and then a few years and, and moving on. But sometimes it also looks like hiring yourself out of the role, which you did in 2020 when you brought on a new CEO to replace yourself, although you are still the chairman of the board. So I think it'd be great to talk through what it looked like to make that decision so I made the transition uh, at the end of 2020. I made this really intense um, effort to hire a great leader. And I knew in the back of my head going into the year that if I found the right person, I was going to make them the CEO um, in, in, in short order, ideally. Um, but I went out looking for a COO or a CRO. And it was in that context that I met Sarah. Um, who was the COO at, at, at Viacom previously. But it's a tricky thing to, to negotiate a, a CEO transition because you can't necessarily talk to a lot of people about it. It's hard to say, talk to the team about it because they're there for you and, uh, and you know, they're going to start leaving. Tell them that you're going to leave. Um, it's hard to talk to the board about it because if you say, hey, I'm thinking about leaving, well, then they have to kick off a search process, right? And so you have to be really like ready for that at the time you're ready to talk, talk to the, to the board about it. Cause it's ultimately the board's responsibility to hire the best CEO. We love, we love the business, but for me, a lot of the fun was, you know, in years past, right. And in the team that I had built and rebuilt and rebuilt, and I just wasn't sure I wanted to like rebuild the team again for, for the next level. Yeah. And maybe just tactically for, you know, some of the entrepreneurs who will have to think about this for themselves in the future, what did it look like? Like what kind of process? And it's going to always depend on your specific situation, but what kind of process do you recommend trying to run? I think you interviewed 100 senior execs. You, then you ended up hiring Sarah and another consultant to actually run 
on a consulting basis, the uh, 2021 strategic planning, which is kind of a sneaky way of <laughs> basically getting someone to do uh, like very relevant work uh, to, to a big part of the job. So tactically, what did it look like to think about how to hire a, a CEO? The pandemic and all, the, you know, basically the, the Zoom renaissance, let's call it, uh, was was great for uh, interviewing a lot of people because instead of having to go and go to some place or sit down and, you know, all the, you know, just there's there's time in that. I could get access to any CEO anywhere and people didn't know that they were interviewing. It didn't know that, you know, like it's just, it, and everyone's at home, yeah. right? Like it was so yep. easy. <laughs> um, it was so easy to talk to a lot of people. Um, and so I took advantage of that opportunity. It was also easy to bring people into the organization. I wanted to see um, how different folks interacted with the team, how they thought, how they acted um, in, uh, in real life, right? And in, in process. And so I was able to bring Sarah into um, all my meetings with me, but not everyone in all those meetings knew that she was in all the other meetings because I wasn't like walking around the office with her all, all, all day long. Um, mm -hmm. And and I had her run the strategic planning process, and uh, and uh, and again, like not the whole company didn't know that she was even doing that because not the whole company was watching like everyone in in, in all of those in all those meetings. So it just felt like it was a it was a good time and good environment to to do it. Um, and uh, and she just she really impressed me with the way that she managed it more efficiently than than I would have. I think got to some better decisions than I would have more quickly, uh, and had this had this energy for it that uh, was was inspiring to me and, and to others on the team. I could see it was going to be a good a good fit all around. She was excited. The team was excited. I was like, great, uh, let's uh, let's do it. Cool, awesome. And then uh, last thing on the betterment front would be to talk through. Um, what's next for Betterment and for the whole robo-advisory category. So there's $35 billion in assets under management at Betterment. We're about to hit about $2 trillion, depending on how you define it, for the robo-advisory category. All that up from zero, you know, a little over a decade ago. But what does that, how does that translate into what's next for the company? Well, uh, one important part of the future for Betterment is this shift this uh, ongoing growth of the B2B channels. We're going to continue to get bigger in retirement uh, and 401ks sold to, to businesses, to workplaces. We're going to get continue to get bigger in HSAs. We're doing more uh, around 529s and, uh, and, and you know, student debt paydowns and all of that kind of advice um, that, uh, that works at the workplace and um, uh, and so you'll see, you'll see more of that. I think you're also expanding into alternatives. You acquired a crypto company recently as well. Correct. We, we acquired Makara earlier this year. We're, we're, um, we believe that, uh, crypto is here to stay. There's going to be, you know, it's still super early, but some form of this, uh, is, is going to be here to stay, uh, and people will want to invest in it somehow. Our advice when, as we integrate, um, crypto offerings is going to be that most people should have less than 5% of their assets in crypto, but we have to be there. Um, and to me, crypto is just part of a, uh, of a hunger for alternatives, uh, that people want more than the traditional 60, 40, you know, stocks, bonds portfolio. They want access to other asset classes because maybe stocks and bonds are all overvalued and, and what do you invest in? <laughs> so, uh, so real estate, um, you know, commodities, they, these things have been available in ETF form at, at Betterment for a while, but I think you're going to see more privates opening up. There's just all of these like new, new fields that are being democratized and, and, and you'll see Betterment continuing to, uh, to innovate and bringing access to a broader and more personalized uh, investment universe. And the last thing I'd say is our customers are thinking about, I want financial independence now. What does that mean? What's financial freedom today? Where I, if I don't want to think about, you know, money too much, but I just, I don't want to have to worry about it. What does that mean? And so that idea of financial freedom uh, is, is, in, is important, I think, to making our customers happy, to meeting them where they are and giving them what they want. And so you'll see us uh, continuing to iterate on advice and guidance around making sure that you have that financial freedom today and, and always. A lot of sense. And what about the category itself, just as it's you know still in early innings, because $2 trillion is 
you know, less than 10% of the opportunity. And it just makes a tremendous amount of sense to allow machines to use rules-based approaches to manage allocations. And it's and it still just hasn't penetrated very far into the entire market. It's like self-driving cars. The idea of like fully automated advice for everything in your financial life, it's still out there a little bit, right? But we're cutting off big chunks of it, you know? Like we've got, we've sort of got the haptic feedback on the steering wheel and the anti-lock brakes and the, um, you know, we've got a bunch of those systems, but you really almost need generalized artificial intelligence to, be, to build all the advice you'd need uh, to yeah. totally automate someone's financial life. But now we're providing all kinds of guidance and nudges and smart feedback and et cetera. And that's just going to keep getting better and better. Almost like self-driving technology is going to keep kind of getting gradually better. It's going to get easier and better. Mapping is better. Da, 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 da. And eventually it'll be totally self-driving. You'll be like, oh yeah, well that, that was easy. You know? <laughs> yeah. That's, yeah. That's yeah. Where we're headed. Yeah. I feel like we've solved some of the problems around, you know, you go into a specific account and you say, how do we do the automated rebalancing of this account? So like within certain nodes, self-driving finance is solved. But then you couple on the edges of what about between accounts? How does that impact your your taxable income? How does that impact future taxable? Like, And all of a sudden, it becomes very complex, very quickly. And you basically need AGI in order to get to the next level. But there's interesting work being done to get towards that. Yeah, that ta place. taxes is this whole other... Taxes interplays with your investing a lot, right? And we obviously do a ton at, at Betterment of, uh, of tax management, and tax optimization. And so there's, there's a lot still to, to build to integrate everything. And then uh, last question, which we'd like to ask of all of our guests on the program, um, is what advice you have for prospective founders, people who might be thinking about starting something uh, in fintech? The thing I always say, and I talk to a lot of founders about this, is, is make it real. So whatever it is that you're pitching, if it's just a slide or it's just a thing that you talk about, it's going to be very hard for people to get their heads around it, join you as team members, join you as investors until you make it real. So so build that template, like, like, like build that demo site, make, get some customers using it, start to get some real world feedback so people can see how it, it it will work and experience it themselves. Yeah, and, and be scrappy when you're doing it. I think my favorite story that we've maybe had from the series so far is how Credit Karma and Ken Lin started their ad campaign, which they were told they're going to need a million dollars, 500 grand to shoot it, 500K plus to buy ad space. And they're like, ah, we'll like buy $30 a prop, get a voice actor off Craigslist, write the script ourselves, and buy excess ad inventory for $75. So they did it for like $200 instead of the million dollars they were quoted. But then a year later, they're spending 120 million, <laughs> and they were doing it in a way it that was. <laughs> it worked well. Yeah, it worked because once they saw it was work, then you could throw a ton of money behind it, as opposed to trying to throw a million dollars into something before you know for sure how it's going to work. You know, we did the same thing. We had such a similar story. We, um, our head of marketing, looked at a video that I had shot for something internal, and he said, "John, I, I think I could make a 30 second spot out of this, and we could, and we could start running it to see how it tests." We, he did. He did it for four thousand dollars. It wasn't two hundred, but you know, he produced this thirty sec out of some footage that yep. we had. And uh, to this day, I think it's our best performing spot ever. It was me and a gray sweater sitting on a couch talking about how awesome Betterment is, and um, <laughs> people, people, people liked the you know. I think the authenticity of like you know, founder direct to to consumer talking about the product. Yep, that's cool. I love it. I love the love the scrappiness. Awesome. Well, this has been super fun. Thanks so much um, for being on the program with us. Thanks, Rex. Uh, really enjoyed it. 